Sunday morning. It sure is good to be able to come this morning to worship the Lord. And uh, today is a special day. Sundays are always a great day. But today is Mother's Day. And uh, from my heart to you, I want to say thank you so much, moms. Thank you, grandmothers. Thank you, ladies who take care of our children and love on them. Uh, I want to say happy, happy Mother's Day to you. We have a short video clip that I want you to watch that gives an explanation of just how important that our mothers are to us. So again, thank you and happy Mother's Day. Well, it's finally happened. You've moved out. You're on your own. Congratulations. But everyone still needs a little help sometimes. Mom, have you seen my wallet? It's in your back pocket. No, I checked there. Your other back pocket, dear. Ah. Thanks, Mom. Introducing the Mom Personal Assistant, the only smart speaker device with all the wisdom, caring, and sage advice of a mother. Mom, please call Brad. Honey, I'm just not sure he's right for you. Just call him. Okay, calling Ryan. No, Mom, I said call Brad. Trust me. The Mom PA always has your best interests in mind. Wish me luck, Mom. Big interview today. Did you eat breakfast? Uh... Is that what you're wearing? Wait, what? <laughs> Did you even shower? She's there to provide a helping hand whenever you need it. Mom, set a timer for 40 minutes. Mom? The mom personal assistant won't function until you say the magic word. Oh, right. Mom, please set a timer for 40 minutes. Sure thing, hon, but it's only 30 minutes for that dish. The mom PA is always correct and basically knows everything. Mom, what setting should I use for this laundry? Mom, do you think I should color my hair? Hey, mom, can you please order mac and cheese? You still have two boxes. What? No, we're out. Did you look? Yeah, I just looked. It's gone. Do you want me to look? Uh, no, no, it's okay. I'll go look again. Try looking with your eyes this time. Based on God's perfect design, the mom personal assistant is thoughtful, kind, encouraging, and supportive. You are beautiful. It's okay. You're gonna get through this. I am so proud of you. You can change the world. But right now, hon, you really need to change your socks because they smell like a dumpster. Ugh, mom. The mom personal assistant. Always helpful, always reliable, and always there for you. Good morning, church. We'd like to say happy Mother's Day to all the moms out there. We'd like to welcome you to our service this morning. We're going to start out with singing, I'm Standing on the Solid Rock.
Well, praise the Lord. Amen. I tell you, it was good this morning to be able to worship with you. And, and I'm just grateful to be able to lift up the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, boy, he's been good to us. Amen. And uh, so thank you again, Bobby and Kimberly and Judy, for uh, leading us in worship here this morning. And uh, so we're going to get right into the Word of God. Uh, that's what we're here for today, is to uplift his name and to see what it is that he has prepared for us. And I'm grateful to be able to preach to you this morning. Um, so let's do this here. Let's take our Bibles and we're going to look at um, Philippians chapter number 3. We're going to take our text today. I'm uh, going to look at several verses of Scripture and I believe that God will uh, meet with us uh, in His Word today. So let's take a look at, if we can, uh, those passages of Scripture. Uh, but before we do, let's open up in a word of prayer and ask God just to bless the, uh, the preaching of His Word. Father, we bless you and we praise you. We thank you. God, we love you, we give you the honor, and you the glory. I pray you'll do something supernatural today. I pray, God, you'll touch the hearts of your people. I pray, God, that you will draw them up near to you. I pray, Father, that you will change lives. I pray, dear God, that we'll understand when we get through this message what it means to be abnormal, what it means for us to not go with the flow, but rather let us be sold out to you because, Lord, you sold out to us. Lord, we give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. There's a woman, and she's a good person. I thought about this woman, morally speaking, you couldn't find uh, much better. She's a good mother. She's a good mother to her children. She is a good wife to her husband, and uh, she keeps the house real nice and neat and clean, and man, she's just got a great spirit about herself, and uh, she calls herself a Christian. The only thing is, is that she sometimes doesn't act the way probably she should as a Christian. She looks at the big sins as being the no-nos, but those little things in life, she seems to want to skim across. I want you to know something here today. That is a woman that is typical in America's churches today. Then there's a man. He too belongs to the church, but... Uh, he only attends church when it is convenient to him, and that is a story that's way too often told among the men in churches today. We are lacking good, godly men in America's churches, in the world's churches. He's provider for his family. He loves his family. He loves his wife, but still he hasn't devoted himself to Christ like he should. Then there's the young person you know that teenager, they may even be a member of the church and as a member of that church, they attend a youth program and they came up through the ranks of maybe an Awana program or some type of a children's ministry and they know all of the lingo. They've been around the Christians and they can, they can quote John 3, 16, but there's just something about their life that is not kosher. Then there's another church member. Let's talk about this church member. This person talks about how much they love the Lord and how much that they love their church family. And they are faithful even to attend the house of God. But they're always defeated. Do you know that person? There's always a person in the church that's always defeated, always the victim, always in the middle of some type of a big spiritual battle. They, uh, they pray, but their prayers are oftentimes selfish types of prayers and they don't honor God. That's the type of church member we're talking about here today. They hear the preaching, the reading of the Bible, but when the warning and the admonishments come, they oftentimes let that skim across them because they don't feel as though it applies to their life. See, when we hear about people like that, we oftentimes think, well, that's just normal Christianity that's just kind of the way it is. I mean, you, you go to any church across America, you open up the doors of the church, and you'll find every one of these people that we spoke about here this morning. And for the most part, that's what normal Christianity to most people looks like. And we think for some reasons that Christianity is supposed to be, uh, uh, supposed to be this oftentimes or are supposed to be this win-win opportunity to, for us, but yet we're supposed to never fail. Can I tell you that's not the way 
that God intended for us to live as a Christian. As a matter of fact, the failures are where you grow the most in your life. And that is where you'll draw up close to God and you'll learn things about yourself and, and, and so that you can be more productive as a Christian for the glory of God. We, we think that this Christian life is supposed to be uh, without struggle, but can I tell you that the Christian life is not without struggle, but in your struggles you can still be a happy Christian. See, I want to shatter some notions this morning if we can. I, I don't want you to think about normal Christianity in the ways that we just spoke of. As a matter of fact, that's abnormal Christianity if you really go by what the Bible teaches us. See, the normal Christian walks in victory in their life, and the normal Christian is in love with Jesus, and they live it out. The normal Christian is not some victim that's always uh, looking for sympathy, but uh, I want you to understand here this morning that the real, true, normal Christian today is an elusive beast that you can't hardly find. It's kind of like Bigfoot. Keep looking for him, but we just don't seem to find him. You don't seem to find her. I want you to know this morning that it is God's purpose and his will for us to live outside of what the church deems as normal and let us live inside the confines of what God says is normal Christianity. We're going to look at some things here this morning I believe will help us to identify what normal Christianity is. If you want to see a normal Christian, then you, know, you can look to the Apostle Paul. See, the Apostle Paul, he lived a normal Christian life. He gave us a great example. He would uh, never have been satisfied with living a life that we discussed earlier as we opened up this thought. He would have never been satisfied with living a Christian life like that. As a matter of fact, his writings, as we look in Philippians here in a few moments, will unveil those things. You see... Uh, you would never have heard the Apostle Paul say some things like this. Well, I'm just uh, doing the best that I can and, you know, everything around me is falling apart and, boy, life's just hard, but uh, I'm still a Christian. You would have never heard the Apostle Paul say something like this. I just can't stop sinning. I'm so weak, it has such a hold on me, and I, I know that I'll never be free from this sin. I, I just don't know what I'm going to do. You wouldn't have heard the Apostle Paul say stuff like that. You'd have never heard him say this. I just feel like giving up. I can't live this way anymore, and besides, no one understands how I feel. You would have never heard Paul say those types of things, but... We find that that is the normal conversation among believers today, and it's not right with God. Oh, preacher, you don't know my troubles, you don't know my struggles, then you must not know my God. Because if you knew my God, you'll understand that the same God that Paul walked with is the same God that we walk with, and if he can walk in victory, honey, so can we. Why don't you look, if you will, in verse number 13 of chapter number 3 of Philippians, and here's what the Bible says. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press toward the gold for the prize of the upward calling of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, that's a key word. I want you to, I want you to dial into that word mature. He said, therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have this mind, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Here's what Paul says. He said, those of us that are mature, he said, we're looking for something that the world can't offer. He said, we're looking for that prize. We're looking for that soon return Jesus Christ, that that we're feasting our eyes upon heaven, waiting for that eastern sky to split wide open and for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to come back and receive us unto himself. That where he is, there we'll be also. Hey, listen, I'm going to tell you something this morning. The apostle Paul wasn't wallowing around in the, mug, in the muck and the mire of this world, but rather he had his eyes feast upon 
Jesus and his glorious return. See, these verses that we read this morning, Paul gives us some insights into what the normal Christian life should be like. Not what we deem as normal, but his life was an example for how we should live. And I want you to take note of these things today. It'll help you if you let it. I want you to, to understand that there are some things in these passages that we're getting ready to look at that I want to point out. And I want to give you three different things this morning I believe will be a help to you if you will allow it. I want you to think about how to develop the normal Christian life. First, I want you to, to, to think with me, if you will, about this. I want you to think about how that you must calculate your losses. You must calculate your losses. And verse number 7 and verse number 8 is where we will find the explanation given to us. And I want us to look at these two verses, verse number 7 and 8. Here's what the Bible says. But what things were gained to me? <coughs> these I have counted lost for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. The King James calls that word rubbish, dung. I want you to know something this morning. He looked at his life and those things of his past. He saw those things as rubbish and as dung. They were not valuable when it was compared to what Christ had done in his life. See, when you think about calculating the losses, it involves us taking a personal assessment of our personal life. Paul's, you know, his past life was one that if you just looked at it from the outside was one that most people would probably want. He had prestige. He was educated. He, uh, he had financial means. He had a good family and and all of these things were not valuable once he come to know Jesus Christ in a real way. If anybody had a reason to hope that they could uh, make it in this life, it would have been the Apostle Paul. If anybody would have thought by looking at him that he would have never made it, they'd have been crazy because he had everything needed to be able to be successful as a person. He had the religious pedigree. <coughs> Not only did he have a religious pedigree, but rather he had the education to go along with it. Not only did he have the education to go along with it, he had the influence as a, as a, a leader to be able to conduct himself in a way that brought him great gains. But here's what he said. He says, I count it as loss. In other words, it is, it, is like, uh, it is like damaged goods. It is like an injury to me to be able to count what I once had before Christ as being uh, what I have now in Christ. See, in Paul's life, what he thought were you know, assets and uh, were really liabilities. And how many of us could say that today? How many of us can say that our, our life is, is, a, is a liability when outside of Christ? But here's, what's, here's the problem. Here's what's going on I see in churches today and within Christian circles. Is we are trying to build Christianity on top of who we were. Listen to me, church. It's not about who we were. We were it is about who we are now. Everything that was once uh, accounted to us in this life should be reflected upon just like the Apostle Paul as being rubbish, as being dung, as being something that is not profitable. Honey, I'm telling you, if you'll feast your eyes on Jesus Christ, it'll give, it'll give you a new perspective in this life. <coughs> I want you to look, if you will, at John chapter number 3, verse number 3. Jesus said this, Jesus answered and said unto him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. I want to build on what I just said just a moment ago. If Paul thought he was going to get to heaven based off of who he used to be, he'd have never made it. 
But because he gave himself to Jesus, because he surrendered his heart and life to the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, just as this passage of Scripture said here, as Jesus commanded, he said, Jesus answered and said unto him, Most assuredly I say unto you, unless one is born again. I, I want to reemphasize something here. If you're not born again, you're not going to heaven. I know that probably hurts some folks' feelings, but if you ain't born again, you've never had an experience with Jesus Christ where he changed your heart you ain't going to heaven. When we think about calculating our losses, we've got to also think about this. It involves a personal accountability. We don't want to be accountable to ourselves. As a matter of fact, we want to live our life however we, however we choose to live it. And, and listen to me, friends. That's not the way the Bible teaches us. The Bible teaches us that we are to surrender ourselves to him and to him alone. Paul uses a, a, a present tense verb to describe what he does with those things that he used to consider assets. He counted them as loss. That word loss is in the present tense, meaning it's still gone. It ain't something that he goes back and revisits. As a matter of fact, he said, that stuff is no longer a part of me. If we would ever get ourselves lined up with this idea that who we used to be, that old man, that old woman is now lost and we're born again, it'll make us live victorious. We won't wallow around in our muck and our mire. We won't sit around saying, just like we did at the beginning of this message, woe is me. Things can't get any better for me. Listen, I don't know about you, but I'm just going to live in victory. I want you to think about, if you will, by calculating that loss, it involves a, uh, um, us accepting what it is that Christ has prepared for us. It involves, just like Paul said, he says, for Christ, in verse number 7, he says, for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, in verse number 8, he says, for whom that I may gain Christ. All of those things in those two passages of Scripture there that we just... Uh, um, um, spoke of gives us a, a road map for personal accountability. It is because of Christ. It is because of the excellency of what I now know in the, in, in, in the, in, in the knowledge of Jesus Christ our Lord. It is because of those things I want to live different. Here's what I've learned about Christians. I've learned that they don't live in that. They live at the altar when they gave their hearts to Jesus, and that's all there is to it. God's forgive me. I'll do what I want to do from this point on. This, that's not the way this thing works. Jesus wants us to live in the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus our Lord. Meaning that he wants us to surrender ourselves to him. He wants us to commit ourselves to him. Let us live in his, form, in, in his knowledge. And if we'll do that, we'll find ourselves in a personal relationship with him. We oftentimes say preachers are very guilty of this. Uh, you, have you got a born-again relationship with Jesus? Most people shake their head up and down because they, somewhere along their life they, they said a prayer of repentance, but they don't have a personal relationship. They may have been forgiven of their sins, but they don't have a relationship. They're walking around living in their past rather than living in the presence and surrendered to God. You cannot have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ until you're personal with him. Then don't you think about after calculating that loss that you must consecrate your life. You've got to consecrate your life. Verse number 8 and 9. Let's look at these verses. He said, yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I might gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, <clears throat> which is from the law, but that which is through, uh, through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. Think about that with me. There is a prescription or there is a, uh, there is a, uh, a, a road that is laid out to be consecrated to Jesus Christ. There is a path that is well beaten that God has given us so that we can be consecrated 
to Christ. When Paul came to Jesus, he counted all of his assets and all of his losses. And then he looked at those things. And not only did he say, it's all gone, but I'm reminding myself every day that it stays gone. It's a day-by-day thing. He's talking about a mindset. He's talking about a mindset of having Jesus first in our life and allowing him to be our everything. It's talking about us surrender. I, I, we use that word a lot of times in churches, but I think it goes over most people's heads. When you talk about surrender, it means to absolutely give away or to give up everything and become subject unto that authority in which you are surrendered to. Very few people learn that fact as a Christian. That's why a normal Christian is an elusive beast, kind of like a Bigfoot. I mean, there's sightings of him, but there's not very many. So, oh, preacher, that's, that's a little hard. I'm just preaching the truth. Let's just be honest about it. Most people come to church when it's convenient to them. Most people give their tithe when they've already went on vacation and they got a little extra left. Most, listen, I'm just telling you what I know today. I'm just telling you what the world looks like. That's why the church is irrelevant today. That's why the church doesn't look like what God intended the church to look like. And, and normal Christianity being that sold out child of the king. But rather, man, the church is wishy-washy. That's what it looks like today. Oh, preacher, you, you, you meddling this morning. I sure am. You know why I'm meddling this morning? Because some of you need to get right with God. Oh, hallelujah, preacher. I'm going to turn you off. You made me mad. You go ahead and turn me off. I'm still telling the truth. I want you to know when you have uh, a consecrated life, it is a pleasure to live in a consecrated life. There's great joy in it. There's great satisfaction. Paul speaks of the excellency of the knowledge. The word excellency means superior, above and beyond the ordinary. Paul says that just being able to know Jesus is a privilege beyond compare. Here is a, uh, uh, here is a, a, a thought that I want you to really wrap your mind around. I want you to really think about it, what it really means to know Jesus in the free pardon of sin. I want you to think about what it really truly means to be delivered from who you used to be and, and being consecrated into Christ. Think about that with me. Think about what that frees you from. Think about what that sets you in motion for. Think about those things this morning. I, I wouldn't want to go back to who I used to be. No, ma'am. No, sir. I don't want to go back there. The reason I don't want to go back there is because there's heartache and pain and suffering and, and, and just disappointment. Think about that consecrated life, and I think about that there's a payoff for a consecrated life. God rewards those who give themselves to him. God rewards us. God, uh, uh, he gives us great things. He gives us great contentment. He gives us great satisfaction. He gives us a, a home in heaven. <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me. He gives us a home in heaven. He gives us a uh, uh, the privilege to know Him in an intimate way. Now, I thought about this, and I thought, I wonder how many times somebody who once knew Paul the way he used to be, maybe they thought he was mental. Maybe they thought he'd have lost his ever loving mind. Maybe they thought, you know, he had fame. He had family he had this great fortune he had everything that anybody could want he's lost his mind to give himself to jesus like this and give all of that up it was customary oftentimes in that day when somebody would convert from judaism into christianity that the family would have a funeral for him let's just think about that for a minute let's think about how that paul being alive and well and potentially we don't know this for sure if it's happened within his own family, but it was customary. Uh, potentially, his family could have been carrying a casket to bury it somewhere. Oh, preacher, that's going a little far. I wonder if the Apostle Paul, while they might have been carrying a casket or having some type of a memorial service for him, if that was something that took place, I wonder if maybe up on the hillside he might have been looking down singing this song here. I'd rather have Jesus 
than silver and gold. I'd rather have him than riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than houses or land. I'd rather be led by the nail pierced hands than to be the king of a vast domain or be held in sin's dread sway. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today. Oh, they may have been singing different songs, but I guarantee you, if this song would have been around that day, it might have been Paul's anthem. See, that's what it looks like to have a consecrated life, is to have peace in the midst of turmoil that is around you. To have a consecrated life means that you are okay with what the world throws at you because you know there's something greater and that's Jesus Christ Amen. third thing I want you to think about is this you must focus your longings you must focus your longings verse number 10 and verse number 11 is what we'll look at here's what the Bible says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being conformed to his death if by any means I may obtain the resurrection from the dead. You think about those verses of scripture here. He says that, that he wants to know him in the power of his resurrection. When we begin to think about the word focus, here's what Webster says about focus. Here's the definition. It's a state uh, or condition permitting clear perception or understanding. When you are focused that means that your attention is dialed into something. I believe that Paul shows us in his, in, in his life and as his writings that his focus was that he had a personal experience with Jesus Christ. And when you have a personal experience with Jesus Christ, man, it'll get a hold of your attention. I don't mean some past by, by experience. <coughs> I don't mean some experience of a, of a pass-by experience, but I mean an experience that has lasting effect in your life. I'm going to say this here. When God saved me, honey, he saved me completely, and I ain't got over it yet. Hallelujah. I've been focused for a long time now. I've been focused because I know what he did for me. He changed who I was to who he wants me to be. Paul says that he wants to know Jesus. He's already talked about his experience in, we've already talked about his experience in salvation. Now he relates that he wants to grow in his experience of the Lord day by day. As a Christian, we should desire day by day growth. We should desire wanting to know more about him and the intimate things. I mean to tell you, when you get up in the morning times and God's just fresh in your mind and that's being focused. I mean to tell you that when you're going through your day and, and the world's throwing chaos at you and it's all fine and good, you're going to be able to deal with it because you got yourself focused on Jesus. I, I mean to tell you that when sickness shows up in your body or maybe in your family member or someone near and dear to you that it doesn't grip you and, and control you, but rather you've been focused because of your personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That's the type of person Paul was. He was like that all the way until death. That focused relationship, it also longed for a powerful experience. You see, I experienced the power of God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He did something supernatural in me. And if you're a believer this morning, he's done something supernatural in you. You see, the power of his resurrection refers to the power of the life of a Christian living as Christ lives through them. See, God lives through me. God lives in me. He lives around me. He is my everything. So therefore, I've got to be focused on him. You see, I, I'm convinced that if people would get their hearts right with God, that their focus would change. When you are in right fellowship with God, all you can think about is how do I bring him praise and honor and glory? It's time for a self-evaluation here. 
It's time for us to look at who we are. It's time for us to, to dig deep and find those things that have been hindering us from focusing on Jesus Christ. You want to be normal and rather uh, uh, what we know the scriptures teaching us as normal Christianity. You want to be a normal Christian instead of one of those abnormal Christians that are always belly aching and, and worrying about how they're going to make it from day to day. If you want to be the real normal Christian, it's going to take you focusing on Jesus and him alone. So we got to make sure that we are focusing on him and, and understand that there's power in the resurrected life of Jesus Christ and that life that lives in us is the power of God. You see, that focused life, not only is it demonstrating the resurrected life in, our, in, in, in us, the focused life longs for a pleasant experience, a pleasant experience. Verse number 11 is about Paul's desire to leave this world in the rapture. See, he desired... To see Jesus Christ in his return to pick up his church. Now, here's the thing about the Apostle Paul. He died in death. He still saw his blessed Redeemer. One of these days, you and I, and I believe we're closer today than we've ever been before. So oh, that's just good common sense. I mean, each day we get a little closer. I don't think you understand what I mean by that. I simply mean this. I believe things are starting to line up for Jesus to come. It's exciting to me. I, I find great joy in that. I find excitement in that. And that's the, the reason I find that is because I'm focused just like he was. He, he wanted to see Jesus in the return, in the rapture, and so do I. I mean, can you imagine that? Go with me if you will. Think this way if you can. Think about if Jesus in this moment was to call us out of this world and, and, and you had the opportunity to sail through the skies, honey, until you reach the other side. Boy, wouldn't that be awesome? Boy, I, I tell you, I, I've always wanted to fly an airplane. I have. I've always, I, I don't know. I just like flying. I like getting up in the air. It's something about it that's exciting. I've never been able to take those flight lessons and, and, and get my, my wings, if you will, to where I can fly airplanes. <coughs> but one of these days, I ain't going to have to take a flight lesson because Jesus is going to let me fly through the sky. Hallelujah. I don't know what that does for you, but it helps me today to know that being focused puts my attention on the return of Jesus Christ. I want to close with, with this thought. I want you, if you will, think with me. Some would say that a normal, normal Christian is boring, or a normal uh, Christian life is, is less desired. But I say the normal Christian life is one that we should all desire because there's excitement in it. There's joy in it. There's peace in it. There's happiness in it. And I'm not going to be one of those abnormal Christians that's all the time belly -aching. Worrying about this, worrying about that, and half in and half out. I'm not going to be that person. I'm going to tell you who I'm going to be. I hope you will be too. I, I, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to be focused on Jesus. Because, honey, he was focused on me. Since he was focused on me, I want to give myself to him completely. I want to be consecrated. I want to be sold out to him. I want to be everything that he wants me to be. Not only do I want to be consecrated, I want to make sure that I'm counting those loss, those things which was before as being my past, not my future. See, my future is assured one day. I'm going to heaven. Honey, I'm telling you, whether sooner or later, I'm going to make it. Whether by the grave or by the rapture, this old boy's leaving one day. I'm telling you this morning, I'm excited to know that Jesus allows me to live a life inside of his son, Jesus Christ. I want to close in a word of prayer. I just want to ask you to examine your hearts today. Just ask the Lord, Lord, am I one of these people who's all the time belly aching? Am I somebody who's all the time just, you know, I, I, I don't live my life the way I should? Am I one of these people that you know, I come to church when it's convenient to me? Lord, is that who I am? 
If it is, God, would you help me to repent? Let me have this relationship that the preacher was talking about this morning. That is the way I pray. I'm just going to pray, God, keep me in right fellowship with you so that one day I see you face to face. Let's close the word of prayer. Father, I thank you. I love you. I praise you. I give you the honor and the glory. God, you have been so, so good to us. Pray, dear Lord, as we pray this prayer, if there is something that is, Lord, there questioning today whether they truly have a relationship with you. I pray God that you'll touch them. I pray dear God that you will confirm that in them. I pray dear God that they may repent. I pray dear God that they will live according to your commandments. And God, I pray for us, God, that we become focused. Lord, that we stay in right fellowship. Because living inside of that surrendered life, there's no greater joy. The Apostle Paul taught us that by his life. Help us to teach others. Help us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for watching today, and I hope that it's been a help to you. And um, again, we are we are closer now to being able to meet again in person. Uh, you're going to be hearing. Uh, from me here real soon about some things that we believe is coming for the church. Uh, but in the meantime, I want you to do this for us. I want you to pray. I want you to pray for one another. I want you to pray for the church. I want you to pray for us to make good decisions and, uh, and, and that God be glorified. So until the next time that we get a chance to meet together, uh, may God bless you.